qualifier against Poland at Wembley. We're joined here by Gareth Southgate and Declan Rice. It'll be the usual format, so we'll shortly start with an opening five minutes from Sky Sports News before we open up for questions. So, as ever, please use your virtual hands or the chat box when you have a question and do remain on mute at all times. Um, if we can keep the questions to one per person and the option of a follow-up after Sky, then that'd be much appreciated. Uh, so, Rob, when you're ready, we to get us underway. Hi, Gareth. Good to see you. Hi, Rob. Um, listen, with any luck, this game could be the last one that England have to play without any fans in the stadium. Um, now, uh, clearly, there's, there's, I need to say, as things stand, and there's lots of caveats there, but with the situation here compared with Europe right now, do you think England and Wembley a better place to host big crowds uh, for the Euros? Uh, well, I guess in the end, that's going to be a government decision, isn't it? Um, we'd obviously love to have fans in, and I think if it's possible, then um, we're certainly geared up to, to be able to hold supporters in the stadium. Um, but we, we also understand that that's got to be done at the right times, and um, it can only be in line with all the other restrictions being lifted, really. There was obviously a bit of a scare this morning around around this game when two more Polish players tested positive. That's, that was four in total. Uh, they've managed to get an exemption for Gregor uh, Krajkowiak in the, in the last half an hour, an hour or so. But do you have any concerns or have any concerns been raised by Premier League managers about the players coming up against Poland when they've had so many positive tests in the squad? Well, we have to rely on the processes. Obviously, this is the same as the league where... Um we're tested uh, two days before the game and um, that's the same criteria throughout, throughout has been throughout the season so there's always an element of risk you know we can't um, eliminate all the risks in for any club at the moment for any national team um, but as far as we're concerned we feel our protocols have been pretty strict and um, fortunately we've we've managed to stay clear of any issues to this point. There's always an element of good fortune in that, you know, who, who knows who could arrive into camp with something and um, with travel as well. But um, fingers crossed we've come through this so far, no problem. Um, Poland have, have clearly been weakened by that and there's no Robert Lewandowski either. Good news from an England point of view, I guess. But the football purists would have loved to see him and Harry Kane on the same pitch. Yeah, but from our perspective, that's... You know, you're going to have some players who are very hungry to fill that opportunity. Um, you know, they've got some very good forwards, Milik, Zielinski, um, Piatek. Uh, they're a good side with some good players. And I've played Polish teams before. They, they fight for the cause. They're a proud country. They're a good football team. They've got a new coach. So they've got high motivation. We all know this is a key game in the qualification group. Um, we've got to keep improving we've shown a good level in our first two matches this week and we've got to keep stepping up and I believe the players can do that um, Mason Mount wasn't training today um, he, he was in the gym we were told does that mean he's unavailable for you for the game and, and, and if so what's the matter with him and, and how big a blow for you no he, he, he didn't warm up with the rest of the team but he, he did the rest of the session after so um, he should be fine Oh, okay. That's that's a big a big relief for you. I was going to ask you about the rotation and, and the and the workload of the players. No England player except Nick Pope has played 180 minutes so far. Um, so does that leave you free to pick your strongest eleven? And and is Mason Mount one of those that that, that very much is in your thinking? Well, they're all available as far as we're concerned. Um, I think we've managed the team not only through the matches but also the training sessions, and we've been very. Um, cautious with the, the load that the players have had so we've got to balance that freshness tomorrow um, but we were very happy with the performance the other day of course and um, yeah I think around Europe most countries have taken similar uh, similar slant on the games so we've got to look at, at the best team to, to win this game and um, we're, we're well prepared for it. Gareth, you know that, that, that whenever the players are with you, they can never be immune from what's going on with the clubs and outside. And, and there's still an awful lot of speculation about the future of, of, of Harry Kane, as you, as you might expect. Do you worry that his club future and discussion about it might dominate talk around the Euros and that it could be a distraction for, for him and for others? No, he's, he's so focused. Um, I mean, I had a chat with him 
as I do with all of the players when they come come into the camp. And I mean, he's very positive about the club. He, he was talking about only being a couple of points off the Champions League in a League Cup final. Um, and you can see his focus in the game the other day. You know, he scored a fantastic goal and uh, an excellent assist as well. So I've got no worries about Harry Kane. He's a fantastic professional. His focus is always on the next training session, the next match, and um, he's somebody that can absolutely put anything to one side. Good man, thank you. I think you've got Declan Rice alongside you, if I could throw a couple his way, if that's okay, Gareth. Um, Declan, you're sitting alongside the manager for a news conference, which kind of makes us think that you're going to start the game again um, against Poland. That'll be two games in four days for you. Um, how physically is, is it easy is it to cope with that? But more importantly... I think it shows that you become something of a fixture in this in this England side, the starting eleven, and, and does that leave you very confident of a place in the Euro squad, or, or don't you think like that? No, I don't think you can you can ever think like that as a player, um, you know, because we've got such a good squad, and you know we've got such strong competition in the middle, um, healthy competition, you know, competition that you want leading into a, a European Championship. Um, going back to the first question, two games in four days. You know, we're used to that at club level. Um, you know, we've we've retained a fitness this season where, you know, we're playing every couple of days. So playing two and four isn't a problem at all. And if picked, you know, I'm always ready to go out there and give the best job for the team. You've become a bit of a social media star in the last couple of days. Um, again, <laughs> they left you again. Your teammates, didn't they? <laughs> I, I just want, has there been a bit of banter in the uh, in the England camp about that as well? Yeah, um, you know, it was funny because when we was on the plane just about to leave Albania, Harry Kane I didn't think he actually realised what had happened and he see the video and he called me and he was like Dex sorry mate um, and I turned around to him had a bit of a laugh with him and then now like I said to, to the boss before this started you know I've been turned into a meme again <laughs> obviously had the one with Mason scaring me and obviously now I've been left hanging so uh, yeah I need to improve on that front <laughs> It was a lovely moment. I mean, you you interacting with some of the fans is lovely, and 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 I think it's 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 it shows a nice side of social media when we talk an awful lot about the dark side of social media. But on the other side of it, Thierry Henry has has come off social media this week and said he's 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 going to boycott it as a, as a a protest of what he feels is a lack of action by the social media giants in in terms of coping with racist abuse and online hate. Look, it's a serious matter, that, a very serious one. Is it something that England's players could do similarly in the Euros, do you think, if if if, if they wanted to force the hand of, of social media companies? I think something definitely has to be done. Um, you know, there's been way too much within the last year, especially with social media abuse, things being said on social media. Um, for someone like me who runs my own account and has that interaction and love with the fans, you know, I don't have any problems with social media. I think it's important that... You know, someone, a player like me can have that interaction with West Ham fans, England fans. Um, but yeah, like you said, Sierra Marie's obviously boycotted it. I see Bale come out and, and said something, you know, maybe a decision that may be spoken about in the future between the players. But at the moment, yeah, no. Come on, one final one for Gareth from me, if that's OK. Gareth, um, you'll, I know you look kept a close eye on what's happening with the under-21s. Um, two defeats out of two. And I just wonder how big a concern that is for you. you you've been in that role yourself and, and you know how difficult the job is when you when you, you lose some of your players to the senior squad and you've, you've got to try and develop players as well as get results. But it does make us worry that, that maybe the, the pathway and, and, the, and the quality coming through from beneath isn't as strong as we might hope. Uh, I think it's a very difficult, it's always a difficult uh, balance because nobody really thinks about the under-21s from outside the organisation until you get to the finals and then they're sort of judged like the senior team and it's development football. So although a lot of those young players are clearly playing well for their clubs and are, um, uh, are good players, they're normally surrounded by experienced players who help them through the games and help manage the games. And when they're playing as an age group together, that's a different sort of challenge. And of course, we've got you know three or four of our starting eleven the other day who um, would be in the better under twenty ones. I think that's always difficult for the under twenty one head coach of every country. Your best players go through to the seniors, and and that's a hard balance. And um, the timing of this tournament coinciding with World Cup qualifiers as well. So it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's always a good question uh, around we want to try to win tournaments when we can. We've definitely benefited from that when the under-17s won the World Cup. 
Uh, some of the under 20s have, have started to come through now, Dominic Calvert-Lewin being, being one of those, of course. Um, but development football is that. It throws up all sorts of things. And even in the difficult moments, you know, we, I went to a European Championship. We had a really um, fantastic game with Portugal that we narrowly lost. Portugal had William Carvalho, Bernardo Silva, João Mario, uh, Guerrero, who are all in the first team. You never know what sort of generation the other countries have got, but even when the results don't go your way, you f you find out so much about the players, and um, it's still a, a, you know a huge part of of their development and learning. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Next, we'll go to Carrie Brown of Bean Sports. Hi, Gareth. Um, talking about competition and uh, squads, this is the last competitive match that those players get to really push your decisions on who will be in this Euro squad. It's going to be tough. There's so many players that are thriving. What did you learn from your playing career about having the news broken to you or watching other players having the news broken to you that shapes you as a manager? We looked at France 98 and uh, Paul Gascoigne not getting selected. Um, any memories? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult situation of, first and foremost for the players, of course, because um, there are very few opportunities in your life to play in a major tournament for your country and it's a motivation for them all and you don't want to be the person that sort of breaks that dream, if you like. Um, I think all you can do is try to communicate as clearly as possible, not just at that moment just before the tournament, but in the lead into it so that there aren't, uh, there isn't a huge shock if you're leaving a player out. Um, that that is a difficult situation. We've obviously got a lot of strength in depth and um, a lot of competition for places. But equally, you know, if we would picked this squad this week, we'd have had seven or eight people missing with injury. So this is a, a slightly unique season in that regard. And um, We've got another few weeks of the season to get through, so so the depth and the options might not be as as plentiful as we we maybe think. You had to name a squad for the World Cup, of course. Um, many more options now, but what did you learn from that experience? And is it harder waiting for the news as a player or delivering it all as a manager? Well, they're, they're both difficult situations. Um, you know, you could, uh, of course, it's not a pleasant, nobody wants to have difficult conversations at work with people. And um, the worst part of being a manager is to tell players they're not playing or if you've got a young player at a club that you're not going to keep them on a contract or offer them a professional contract, they're, they're, they're life-changing moments. So you've got to always... Um, be aware of the, the impact of those conversations on, on the people you're delivering the, the message to. Um, and, and of course, for the players, that's, that's extremely hard. You know, they're, they're building up to it. Some would be more assured in their mind of their place and there would be others who, who wouldn't be certain. So, yeah, you can only be as open, as honest and respectful as possible. Um, but in the end, you have to make tough calls and uh, we, we all know... The boys have been in a game that's a, a, a sort of performance pathway and, and they've faced selection at every age group. You know, every age group at the end of the season, they've been through that battle and, and they're hardened to it, but it doesn't make it any easier when you miss out on, on big events that you want to go to. Harry, next we'll go to Fred Caldeira from TNT Sports Brazil. Hi, Gareth. Um... I would like to come back to the, to the hurricane uh, subject. And, and rather than speculating about his future, I would like to ask you if, if you think it's, it's essential, uh, necessary for him to win titles, to be amongst the greatest English players. Uh, when I mean titles, of course, he can win trophies with England as well. Yeah, I think Harry is, of course, a highly motivated player. And... Um, all players want to win, you know, they want, they want to win things and um, he's got an opportunity with his club in the next few weeks to, to do that. I've got four players in the other dressing room as well, so um, I can't state any sort of preference for that. Um, but you want to be in the latter stages of competitions, you know, he's played in a Champions League final with Tottenham. Um, he's now got a, a, a second League Cup final uh, coming up. And um, 
for certain those are the occasions as players you want to be involved in you want to be involved in the major tournaments and you want to be in a, the important uh, the important matches uh, domestic cups and, and the league of course Thanks Fred Next we go to Alex Howell of BBC Sport Hi Gareth uh, just on team fitness as well um, is there any other selection issues or is everyone fit and ready to go? No everybody available yeah Okay, great. Thank you. And just uh, an issue off the field. Uh, you're taking part in a dementia study. I just wanted to ask how that's going and if you think football is doing enough to look into issues in that area. Yeah, I, I've um, sort of completed some of the tests that, that are, uh, are being conducted on uh, former players. So um, that, that data is being collated somewhere. Um, I, you know, I've also, on the back of that, had um, interaction with some families who've been going through that process and that difficulty with ex-players. And I have to say, you know, I I went through that process with one family in particular um, with the PFA, and I thought the support was excellent for them, and we were able to help with, uh, within the FA as well. So, um, you know, I think there is a lot going on in the background. Um, the research is ongoing. Um, we're, we're very aware of the importance of it. I think Charlotte, within our organisation, Charlotte Cowie is doing an excellent job. And, um, you know, it's, we, we understand that takes time. It's going to take time to collect all of the information required because it's easy to um, get small amounts of data, small amounts of information and come to the wrong conclusions. And that would be equally dangerous. So... Um, we've, we've got to make sure that, that that research is done as thoroughly as possible. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Uh, next, we'll take a question from uh, our Polish friends, uh, for, starting with Wojciech Demuziak from Goal. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good evening, coach. Uh, I have a question about uh, Paulo Sosa. Uh, Paulo Sosa didn't have much time to get to know the players and prepare for this match. Will this be your advantage? Oh, I think um, it's obviously you want to work with the players as much as possible. It's been great for us this week um, to have the time with the players on the training pitch um, and to be able to build th through the games. Um, of course, whenever a new coach arrives, there's huge motivation for the players to show him what they can do. And there's a freshness about his message. So we can see some of the things from the games you've already played um, that, that they've attempted to change from um, the, the matches they had in the autumn. Um, we have to wait and see whether they're going to play the same way tomorrow night at Wembley, but I'm expecting them to, to press us well. Um, they've got good attacking players, um, exciting attacking players that are going to be a test for our defence. And um, we're going to have to be at our very best to, to win the game. We'll check. Next we'll go to Robert Ellis from Perform. Hi Gareth, um, I wanted to ask you um, about Sergio Aguero um, who will be leaving Manchester City at the end of the season. How important has he been to the development of the Manchester City players that you have in, in your squad, particularly um, Raheem Sterling and, and Phil Foden? Um, very difficult for me to say because I don't really need to speak to them about that. Um, he's obviously been a fantastic player for Manchester City and um, that landmark goal that landmark moment for them um, as a club for their fans will be there forever so they've been very good at recognising um, those former players or those players that have left and um, uh, I think they've done that very well as a club over the last few years um, but yeah in terms of his impact on those other players really you'd have to ask them that Robert next go to Dom Smith from englandfootball.org Hi, Gareth. Hi, Declan. Just uh, one question from me. If I can get an answer from you both, that would be great. Obviously, you've got to balance the fact that these three are World Cup qualifiers, but the, the qualifiers are, are basically um, you know, split in half um, down the middle by the European Championships, effectively. So while on the one hand, you'll be pleased that there's no Lewandowski because it makes your life a bit easier. I mean, are you, I suppose, a bit disappointed that actually you can't test your defence against who is effectively, you know, the best striker in the world, or, or if not, then I suppose Harry Kane is. But yeah, yeah, I, I understand the question, but 
I just think Poland have got some excellent players and we'd be naive to think that they're going to be less of a threat tomorrow night. They'll be highly motivated. There's an opportunity for other players coming in. And if we think of taking our foot off the gas for one minute, then then we'll get hurt. So we've got to be ready for the game tomorrow, which I believe we are. Um, of course, for the public, they want to see all of those star names, but a team isn't just about one player and um, we, we've got to prepare to, to, to the very highest level. And Declan, on that, please, if I can get your response, please. Yeah, exactly like what, what Gareth said. Um, we'd be naive to think that, you know, they're not a top side and they haven't got quality all over the pitch. You know, most of their players are playing in the Premier League, Bundesliga, Serie A. They've got two excellent strikers up top in Piatek and Milik who are known goal scorers. So we need to be on it. We need to be focused. We need to be ready um, because they're going to come with a big threat. You know, for them, they're going to want to beat us at Wembley. And for us, you know, it's a chance to, to end the week well with three wins out of three. So it's going to be a real, a real tough game, but we're, we're really ready for it. Thanks, Bo. Best of luck. Thanks, Thank Dom. Uh, two, we've got two more left in this segment of the media activity. So next we'll go to Alex James from Lanks Live. Hi, Gareth. Thanks for your time. And just a quick one from me. Nick Pope made history on Sunday by being the first keeper to keep clean sheets in his opening six England appearances. Yet there remain some question marks over his kicking and over his distribution. Do you have any concerns on that front? And do you subscribe to a theory that maybe he might need to leave Bernie to help improve that aspect of his game? <laughs> I can just imagine Daishi being delighted with me uh, <laughs> commenting on that. Um, you know, I, I would never comment on his... Uh, teams um, Nick has proven through his um, time at Burnley to be one of the best goalkeepers in the league and height of consistency so primary job for a goalkeeper is to keep the ball out of the net first and foremost it's uh, at times a much undervalued trait he's very good at it um, I think he's, he's competent with the ball at his feet um, there's obviously players that uh, uh, are playing in a, in different patterns with their clubs, but he uh, he's coped more than uh, more than well in the matches we've had. Um, Kosovo away was a game where, although we'd qualified, there was pressure of the crowd, and it was good experience for him to be in a in, in a in a competitive qualifying game. So um, yeah, I've been really comfortable with Nick being in between the posts for us I've not had to you know spare a second thought I haven't spoken to him too much about it during the week because I'm happy for him to crack on with his job and um, he's um, he's got a great temperament for for these sorts of uh, games thanks, thanks that's all the best tomorrow night thank you and we'll finish with one more from Kerry Brown a question for Declan please hello hello um Gareth doesn't come out with hair dryers. Um, so when he said post-match, he thought that there were areas of the game that could have been tightened off, that the team could have killed off the game. Have you, how have you all responded? Have the goals been flying in? Sorry, say that again. I'm um, sorry. Post-match, Gareth said that um, the team could have uh, tightened up and killed yeah. off the game. That's probably as close as a hairdryer as you'll get from Gareth Southgate post-match. Um, he just gives advice and, and says where you can improve. Have the goals been flying in then in practice? How's it been this week? Yeah, so we've obviously, for me, today was the first day I trained. The day after the game's always always a recovery day. Um, but I'm sure Alan, the, the, the first team striker coach, you know, he had them, he had them finishing. Um, you know, on the pitch, you know, you felt that. He was right, you know, 15 minutes to go where we'd been in such dominance of the game. You know, we kind of sat back and let them have a little bit more of the ball. Um, there were a couple of chances where we was on the counter attack, and we could have killed it off with a with a better final pass. Um, and there was other things, you know, on the pitch that we could have managed a bit better. And you feel that as a player, you know, where you dominate the whole game and they start to have a bit of the ball, it becomes frustrating. Um, so yeah, look, areas to improve on, and I think it's always good to um, to improve on on different parts and different parts of the game. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. That concludes this part of today's media activity, and thanks for joining us.